Hello, hello everyone, and uh, welcome back to our Stratcom webinars. I remind you, this is our first, we uh, first webinar, and this time we're going to look at the almost mythological subject of deep fakes, where I would argue that the number of uh, discussions and seminars at the scientific and policy community far exceeds the number of actual impactful deep fakes we've seen so far. But to crack this subject, we have a uh, very good and uh, speakers, thought leaders, if I may put it that way, that have, uh, have written a number of pieces on the subject. And therefore, I'm, I'm very glad to introduce uh, Ting Huang, who is the director at Harvard MIT Ethics and Governments of AI Initiative. Tim, hello. Hello. Tim has joined from uh, New York. And, of course, Keir Giles, Research Director, Conflict Studies Research Center. And he, as he said, has joined us from the blank spot in the middle of England, as you can see. Hello, Keir. Hello. Good afternoon. And we have also invited the third person, and that is, uh, if it works well, uh, um, somebody that could hopefully uplift our spirits and in these dire times remind us that we will always win whatever the odds we have and um, even with the most uh, dire circumstances we can always uh, succeed. And as you can see, um, it's not just a myth, we actually can do some uh, deep fakes. And this one is one that can be easily uh, told apart from the real deal. But uh, people are doing that, especially in these uh, Zoom times when, uh, when you're finished with uh, experimenting with your backgrounds, people have made available the code that you can uh, change your faces when participating in your office meetings. Not to advertise this, but I think that's uh, a good reminder how 
this deep fake industry, if I may put it that way, is creating these technological advances. Most of that, as we've seen, is for fun, for entertainment, for some kind of profit. But of course, there always been the rumor about the potential big, big deep fake that can disrupt uh, uh, societies, that can disrupt political situations, and that can make a uh, strong impact in the national security. And for that reason, we want to dissect this problem today to look at what is the present status of the uh, deep fake and what is the future trajectory. And uh, I'll first uh, ask Tim, can you share with your thoughts what are these what, what is the status right now? What's the technology behind? And what do you see the, the future trend? Tim. Great, Giannis, thank you. Um, yeah, hello everybody, very excited to be here. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that demonstration is, is actually a great place to start. Uh, I think it's very easy to see some of the things that have been you know, in the mainstream media uh, and demonstrations of deep picks that have been flowing around the web. And you know, the mind sort of immediately goes to sort of the nightmare scenario. Um, my argument has always been that in order to really analyze uh, the impact of deep fakes, understand how they'll shape, for example, uh, campaigns of disinformation online, um, you really need to understand uh, the, the technology. Um, and so let me, let me start there. Um, I think the, the first thing to know about deep fakes uh, is that ultimately they're a demonstration of some of the recent breakthroughs that have happened in the field of machine learning, uh, which is really a subfield of, of artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, I think understanding machine learning actually goes a long way to understanding where the sort of threats are uh, from the technology and where, you know, some of these risks might be overblown. So let me just begin there. Um, there is a, a lot of kind of technical jargon that can be very intimidating, but it actually turns out that the, the sort of intuition behind machine learning um, is actually really easy to understand. Uh, and the way I explain it goes a little bit like this. Um, imagine you're trying to tell a computer how to recognize, uh, say, a flower in an image. Well, there's one way you can imagine doing it, right, which is to bring together lots and lots of people to write rules for what a flower might look like. We say, oh, well, maybe flowers appear with only certain types of colors or certain types of shapes, and we could program those rules explicitly into a computer. Um, and this was, in fact, the, the long-standing way of doing things in computer science, uh, something that they used to call uh, feature engineering. And uh, machine learning, uh, in some ways, goes at it from a different direction. It says, okay, well, rather than having a bunch of humans explicitly program these rules into the machine, what we'll do is we'll instead give a computer lots and lots of examples of, of flowers to recognize. And the machine, after looking at thousands, sometimes even millions of these images, will extract an understanding. Um, and that understanding is known as a representation. So um, you can, in the future, feed it images of flowers, and it basically says, is this similar to what I've learned in the past looking at all the other previous images uh, of flowers? Now, what's interesting is that these machines, as I mentioned, get a certain kind of understanding about the task that they're trained on, right? So if you want to recognize, say, images of Donald Trump in images, um, the machine will learn a representation of what Donald Trump looks like, right? It needs to have that understanding in order to accomplish the task. And what machine learning researchers have discovered is that they can actually take this representation uh, and get the machine to generate many, many things that look like the thing that it tr was trained on, but that have never, ever existed before. Right? So if you have a, a model that is trained on lots of images of flowers, you can get the machine to spit out new images of flowers that have never existed before, right? because it understands on some level what a flower looks like. Now, needless to say, to go to my other example, if you have a machine that's trained on an understanding of what Donald Trump looks like, we can also generate lots of images and media uh, that, that appear to be him. Right? And, and this applies not only to images, but to video uh, and, and audio um, as well. And so this has actually generated a lot of fear because, you know, I think one of the interesting things is that we find that these computers um, are able to create simulations uh, at a very high level of fidelity. Um, and so while in the past you may have someone say, okay, well, we need to Photoshop this politician into an image. Um, those, those might have been kind of easily detectable. You look at them and it's obvious that it's been a Photoshop. Um, the main problem has become that a lot of these deep fakes on first examination can look very similar to the real thing. So with that explanation of machine learning, um, 
you know, I think we can ask the question, what are the sort of implications on strategy and implications on sort of the future of disinformation campaigns? Um, and I think the thing to keep in mind here is that just because a technology can be used, it doesn't necessarily always mean that it will be used. Um, as Giannis was mentioning, one of the very interesting things that we've been seeing is that despite all of the hype and news reporting and, and these very kind of clear demonstrations of how the technology can be used, by and large, a lot of the data doesn't really suggest that disinformation campaigns are, are using this technology in any big way. Um, and, you know, I think one idea, one intuition for why that might be the case is that it's still cheaper to spread disinformation without using all of this uh, advanced technology, right? Um, one of the classic tactics of a disinformation campaign is that you just take an image and then you caption it something that uh, is not accurate. Right. So you say, oh, this is an image of, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this minority beating up another minority, right? It's a stake, a stoke, say, racial tensions. Um, and that's very cheap, right? It doesn't require any machine learning. It doesn't even require anyone to Photoshop. It just requires you to pull an image from somewhere, decontextualize it, and then distribute it again. Um, and so I think when you are thinking about, you know, how much should we care about deep fakes? What should we do about it? Uh, I think it's important to keep two big trends in mind that I think are really reshaping how um, this technology will be used in the field. So the first one is commodification, right? So Giannis's demonstration in the beginning is a great demonstration of, of this, right? Which is that basically a lot of the technology starts in the lab and then it becomes easier and easier and easier to use. People create software to do it. Uh, you no longer need to be a technical specialist to deploy these types of technologies. And so I think on one hand, we should anticipate that more and more people will have access uh, to sort of these low grade deep fakes, right? The deep fakes that are, you know, computationally easy to produce, don't really require much expertise or resources to create. Now, I generally tend to be a little bit skeptical that these will have a large scale impact over time. And the reason is because uh, of what's happening in the world of deep fake detection. So obviously now that you have a bunch of machine learning researchers producing deep fakes, uh, you also have a bunch of machine learning researchers interested in trying to figure out how to identify them. And what we know from the technical literature right now is that the things that are easiest to detect are uh, sort of deep fake generation tactics of which there are lots of examples to train on, right? So the easiest way to generate a deep fake detector is just to have lots and lots of examples of deep fakes. Um, and so these commodified deep fakes will probably be more likely to be detected in the future in part because there's lots of samples that researchers can use to create effective detection algorithms, right? And so uh, my anticipation is that while, you know, we will see more commodification of deep fakes, the detection of commodified, uh, commodified deep fakes will also become easier and easier. The second trend, which I think will be a more persistent threat, is what you might think of as sort of sophisticated deep fakes. So uh, much of what we know is that it will take something on the order of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to produce a, a sophisticated custom deep fake. Now, that might be out of reach for your garden variety troll, right, someone who just wants to cause trouble online. But obviously for a state actor, it's like that's not very much money at all. And so we should anticipate that there will be uh, more sophisticated campaigns that will deploy this technology in the future. And you know, I think that that lends itself to really two things that we need to do in response. Um, one of them is I think we need to get much better at being able to sort of identify and attribute these campaigns. Um, and uh, I think that really will take some specialist uh, skills, right? And, and I think that there is a need to kind of create these new teams uh, that are really proficient, I think, at, at, you know, diagnosing and detecting not just deep fakes, but I think the whole suite of tools that more sophisticated actors might use in the space. Um, the second one that I'm very interested in is um, that you know, there's a, there's a new development actually in the world of machine learning. Um, it's something that they call radioactive data. So these are markers that you can basically put into data that if you train an algorithm on top of it, it's very easy to tell whether or not deepfakes generated are fake or not, right? You can basically poison the, the training data that is used in these algorithms. And in many cases, training an algorithm and gathering the training data is the most expensive part of the training process, right? So you imagine, you're not trying to simulate someone prominent like Donald Trump that has lots and lots of images online, but it's someone less prominent, right? Uh, collecting that data can be very expensive. And so I am very interested in the use of these kind of um, radioactive markers as a way of increasing the risk to sophisticated actors that say, okay, well, 
you know, are we going to use deep fakes or are we going to try to spread this information through some other route? And if in the deep fake case, they feel like, look, there's all sorts of poison data out there that might be used to easily diagnose the kinds of fake images and videos we're going to try to create, it might actually act as a very interesting disincentive for them to engage in these types of tactics. And so I think, you know, this is a way of talking about, you know, I think the, the reality that there are lots of really interesting sort of technical tactics that might be used um, to sort of change the landscape and make it more or less expensive um, for, for these kind of more sophisticated adversaries to use um, this technology. So anyways, I want to keep it relatively short. And Giannis, I think you have a few questions. So um, let me put it uh, there. And um, yeah, looking very much uh, to the discussion. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Tim. I think... Uh... Very interesting. I, I was just wondering when you when you were talking about the democratization of the uh, deep fakes, which is basically mm -hmm. the thing that we're increasingly seeing. And mm -hmm. I imagine the point where there would be app uh, developed uh, that can be then given to Google or uh, Apple Store for introduction, where everybody can download and create a simplistic or mm -hmm. not so simplistic. Uh, um, deep fake. Do you think we have pre-positioned ourselves legally and process-wise to the moment when there would be m many, many different products on scale allowing that kind of uh, deep fake production, probably not that sophisticated, but still swamping the whole area with, with, with mm. questionable information? Right. So I think that the interesting, so, so there's two components to that question. I think one of them is uh, that, yes, uh, I, I think that there will be a lot more apps in the future that allow deep fake production, right? Uh, I think a lot of apps find it that it's a, it's a fun thing that people like to do. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that they can make a business on creating apps in the space. And so uh, I think we should expect that it's going to become easier and easier to produce deep fakes. Now, at the same time, I think one of the most interesting things that's happening is that a lot of the big social media intermediaries, right, so your Facebooks of the world, world your Twitters of the world, um, have published policies that are explicitly against deep fix, right? They say you can't use it to impersonate people, right? You can't use it to spread a false narrative, right? And I think a lot of these platforms are implementing automated systems to do deep fake detection and deep fake takedown. Um, and as I mentioned, one interesting aspect of the fact that deepfakes are becoming more commodified is that simultaneously there's a lot of data with which to train deepfake detection systems. So I think one of the ways these trends will intersect is basically that while it will become easier and easier to produce deepfakes, um, a lot of the places where they might spread most effectively, so say on your Facebooks and Twitters of the world, are getting a lot more aggressive about taking them down. And so I think what you'll tend to see is that these deepfakes will start to appear in um, you know, the more closed places of the web, right? They'll spread through closed uh, private chat networks, for instance, or they, they might spread through, um, you know, other ways that are not necessarily, you know, dependent on these few very large platforms. And I, so I think that while deepfakes will sort of be excluded from many different parts of the web, they'll still kind of percolate in these, these more shady, shaded, shaded areas, if that makes sense. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Tim. Now, Care, uh uh, in your piece uh, that you wrote some time ago about the deep fakes, you were actually uh, pointing to an example where by using a somewhat simplistic, I would say, uh, not simplistic, but simple technology of deep fake, you can achieve specific results if you attune it to the wider scale um, strategy of uh, influence operation and disinformation. How do you see, is it... Do we really need this big scale or very sophisticated uh, deepfake to make an impact? Or the human creative factor can always make it work irrespective of that? Care. Well, the human factor, of course, is key to both the offense and the defensive side. But I agree absolutely with Tim that uh, the threat of one-off sophisticated deepfake videos is probably overstated at the moment, but I think so for different reasons. I think that we are already past the stage at which they would have had maximum impact because deepfake video is the dog that never barked. We spent years waiting for deployment of a deepfake video to influence some major political event. Ever since late 2016, early 2017, when the technology was mature and viable, even if it wasn't widely accessible by that stage, we've been expecting some 
public figure to be seen saying or doing something that they didn't in actual fact in order to influence an event or simply to discredit them. So we've been asking ourselves, why didn't it happen? We thought that malicious actors would maybe withhold use of these deepfake capabilities until they were faced with an event that was sufficiently major that justified launching them against unsuspecting adversaries. Now, if that's the case, they've been withheld too long because the adversaries are no longer unsuspecting because of this democratization of this commodification that Tim was talking about. Instead, deepfakes have become pervasive and widely accepted and widely understood, not just case studies and demonstrations like the one you gave just a few minutes ago, Yanis, but virtual influences, commercial applications, virtual news readers, for example. So they no longer have the power to shock Deepfake videos are widely understood and therefore they would be widely discredited. You can point to something and say, no, that's a deepfake. And broadly speaking, the public that is willing to be convinced will understand what you're talking about. So I think the problem we need to look at is what is actually coming next down the track and what are the other ramifications of this technology. And coming back to your question, Yanis, yes, perversely, the easier fakes might actually be the more directly useful and powerful. Because those systems that, uh, that Tim explained are also capable, for example, of generating authentic voice imitations. They can impersonate a known individual quite effectively. They can successfully imitate a, a chief executive officer to defraud a company, which has already been done. Or they could impersonate a commanding officer to deceive a military unit, which, as far as we know, hasn't been done yet. And there's also the, the cheap fake, the dumb fake, the straightforward editing. Much of the effect of these deep fakes can, as Tim said, be achieved just by sophisticated overdubbing or by Photoshop. People are concerned about the erosion of trust in objective truth or reality, but that is not, in fact, a new problem. That's been a process that's been ongoing forever. Never mind the audio or video we see now. That's, that's been a process since the very first flattering portrait made you doubt whether you were looking at a accurate representation of an individual. But the currently available tools that are now so widespread and so easily accessible just continue this trend of the, the techniques and technology that are required for deception overall becoming faster and easier and simpler and cheaper and more widely available, and much less of a specialist skill. And that too is a long running process. Uh, when I was first taught to, to edit audio, it was on reel to reel tape, which you would cut and splice quite literally with a razor blade and sticky tape. Now, technology has moved on a little, but the underlying principles of deception are still exactly the same. And as you alluded to just in your question to Tim just there, the real strength of machine learning for generating this kind of deceptive content isn't in plausibility, which might always be imperfect. Instead, it's in scalability, for which it is absolutely ideally suited. Because if you're creating an entirely fictitious artificial individual, the challenge is simpler than a real life politician that you have to fake. Instead of uh, being convincingly like a specific person, it has to be just convincingly realistic. So one of the most significant capabilities of these tools that uh, Tim mentioned is generating a chimera that's capable of convincing viewers they're interacting with a real individual, scaling it. Scaling it and replicating it and producing mass campaigns at close to zero cost, which might be aimed simply at influencing the most gullible or careless individual out of a given target set to, to go along with it. And that's where you see the problem of astroturfing through mass, generating the impression of political consensus in order to sway elected leaders or to sway an electorate at a critical moment. And it can be not as sophisticated as video. Even the production of deceptive text output by machine learning systems is potentially really quite dangerous. If we think back to the early part of the last decade, uh, Russia found that automated systems were inadequate to influence debate on domestic or international fora and social media, and they needed human intervention in the form of professional trolls in order to be effective. But now, with the development of machine-generated fake text, those trolls could actually finally face replacement by automated systems for everything but the most sophisticated of interactions with real humans. And that removes a lot of constraints for disinformation campaigns. So the result of that automated astroturfing could be a massive scaling up of operations, generating an entire fake public to influence political decisions. And again, it can be very cheap. There's even a simple textual equivalent to, to so-called dumb fake videos. Consider how easy it is to produce an image that looks like a screenshot of a tweet in order to sow confusion and discredit public figures.
So the pace of development is incredibly fast, but we have found that we can track it and we can therefore predict what the future tech threats will be. That uh, paper that you mentioned, which examined the case of Katie Jones, the first known artificially generated face used for a malign influence campaign on LinkedIn, a paper that was produced through Yosenti and is uh, co-authored with Kim Hartman and Mudir Mustafa. That was describing an event that took place in April last year and saying, this is a harbinger. There will be lots more like this. We need to pay attention to this because it will be a commonly used tool. Come November, and you see that that is exactly what has happened. You have the detection of a malign influence campaign using legions of KTA-like fake faces generated using the same system. So you can, in fact, see what is coming down the track a little bit further in advance and prepare for them. Which leads us to the question, what are we actually likely to see in the near future? I think it is going to be ubiquitous deepfakes in the form of video or audio or still image as that scalability and that accessibility of the deepfake production continues to increase. But further, there'll also be developments in human computer interface science, especially in the field of emotional modeling, which might potentially allow deepfakes to generate real-time lifelike responses in live interactions and therefore become even more convincing. And in machine learning generated text, what about allowing bots to adapt their approaches dependent on human reactions and auto-generate narratives? What that means is instant disinformation responses to developing situations on a mass scale but targeted and tailored to individuals. And responding in interactions, taking their cues from how human targets react and adjusting their tactics in real time to maximize the effect. Also, what could deepfakes actually be used for? If you look at current disinformation efforts, they're often focused on denying that a particular event has taken place or somebody's done something. Well, deepfake technologies make it easier to do the opposite, to convince the adversary that something has happened when in fact it did not. Instead of Russia saying, our troops aren't in Ukraine, what if they convincingly explained actually they are present somewhere else and it's a complete fiction based on deepfakes? And that Capability to convincingly reproduce the voice of a known individual could completely revolutionize principles of social engineering, and that has implications for private individuals. Because if you're a private citizen, you face two different categories of deepfake enhanced risk. If you're a high visibility individual, you could be imitated in order to deceive others or to attack your reputation. But less prominent people, ordinary citizens, are also at risk. It's a different form of risk because apart from those high-profile national security implications, there's potential for simple fraud against financial institutions and the individuals that use them. In an environment where you're using voice and face recognition in order to authenticate customers, where voices and faces can be easily replicated, this poses a, an obvious security risk. They might eventually be no more secure than the authentication text-based passwords that they were supposed to replace. So we will continue to hear these dramatic predictions of the consequences of a deepfake video being launched for political purposes. Sometimes it's justified, sometimes it's a bit overstated. But I think the more important process is this normalization, which is driven by this increasing and increasingly accepted prevalence of virtual individuals, especially in marketing. There's going to be a side effect, which is the erosion of confidence in whether any online interaction is actually with a real purpose person. That may have social consequences, or it may, again, become normalized and accepted. But the key to this, again, as we started, lies in human behavior. Deepfakes shouldn't be treated as an entirely distinct phenomenon from other forms of deceptive content because their creation isn't indicative of any kind of change in human behavior. Whether it's in audio or video or still image or anything else, each new technology brings with it new means of deception. So rather than treating them in isolation, we should see them just as an addition to the existing arsenal of deception, an addition which might, under certain circumstances, offer more effective delivery. It's just another example of these well-established trends of disinformation tools becoming both more sophisticated and more accessible to a wider range of malign actors with a much wider range of budgets. What we need to do is address the underlying principles instead of that specific phenomenon, not based on technology, which changes constantly, but based in human nature, which remains constant because that is what is being exploited by the disinformation campaigns. We can have operational solutions, technical ones. We can chase detection. We can have a Voigtkampf test across different domains to try and identify deepfakes deep in real time. That will be an ongoing arms race as sophistication of the creations becomes more and more advanced. We have to match it with increasingly sophisticated detection algorithms.
We can protect against ourselves, ourselves against the specific forms of fraud that might exploit deepfakes by taking measures to preempt them. But the underlying principle is the same as for any other malign influence campaign, and that is that it is awareness and education and a proper, well-informed threat perception across users throughout the whole of the organizational chain of command, which is the best weapon against deepfakes and any other form of malign influence. User education and explaining just what the risks involved in deepfakes are in the same way as we've seen very effective campaigns in, for example, cyber security across a number of different nations is going to be the key to solving this problem. That has to be combined with awareness on future developments because adversary approaches evolve and adapt and they adopt new tools and they move on. They identify success and they build further on it, which means that if you're a nation or an organization that is focused on the threats that we are already aware of and have seen deployed already, like deepfake videos, then you are going to be taken by surprise by the next step in this evolution and some of those next steps we can already predict. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kerr. Uh, I think you quite eloquently uh, moved us back to the human nature. And, and, and I think it's interesting that also the reason why we're so much talking about the deep fakes it goes back to the human nature because um, we can relate to that phenomenon much, much easier and much better than so many other of the disinformation phenomena. Uh, but uh, your, your points actually... Uh, promoted me one to me to one thought and that is do you think our opponents and uh, you alluded to to Russia and I think China has been part of the game and other actors are scaling their operations Iran uh, namely but also others do you think they have a strategy or they just doing a trial and error trial and error kind of trying to to, to poke their way through the, the maze and understand what is the best way? Or is it a, a grand strategy? I think it would be very dangerous to generalize across different nations and even <laughs> to generalize within specific nations. Each of those adversaries you've mentioned, and many more besides, and this is not limited to nation states, will have their own approach to exploiting this technology to achieve their aims. Let's not forget, of course, that it may be nation states that have led the current fashions for malign influence, but of course they're being emulated by domestic political actors across a huge range of different societies. But the key point here is that you no longer need to be well financed and well resourced to launch this kind of campaign. It is so easily accessible as you demonstrated yourself during the introduction that really anybody can do this. And they can tap into that key feature of human nature that some people will be willing to be convinced even by the most transparent of fakes. You can explain to most of the public most of the time that no, this is, this is a forgery, this should not be trusted. However, if somebody is intent on believing it, whether they are an agent of influence, a useful idiot, or just a plain old idiot in the good old fashioned sense, then they will do so regardless of any publication education campaign. And all of these malign actors can exploit that sector of the population that is willing or intent on being convinced. Well, yeah, thank you. And before we go to the uh, questions which uh, start coming in, I would have one question to both of you. And that is how, how much you are confident in the detection systems we're right now having on the deep fakes uh, relative to the phenomenon uh, that we're seeing. Are we well equipped at this point in time? Because I think two years ago we, we would have had this debate. We would say, oh, no, no, and, and there's a big danger. What is your current assessment of our capabilities? Sure, happy to chime in there. I, I mean, the way I, I think about the detection space right now is, uh, that we have the tools. Uh, the question is whether or not we'll be able to use them effectively. Um, a, a lot of what we see in the lab, for instance, suggests that, yes, indeed, if we, if we are nimble at collecting examples of deepfake creation technologies as they appear, it's possible to create uh, detection systems for them, right? Um, but the, the problem is that there's no central sort of clearinghouse for that kind of information at the moment. Um, and there's no team that's really dedicated to uh, being out there in the field, collecting these samples, and then helping to make sure that um, those can be given to people who are building detection systems. Um, and so I think the, the, the path is clear, but I think the coordination around it and, and the, the ability to kind of create this kind of you know, I've been thinking about it sort of as a deep fake zoo, right? Like to actually have all these different examples um, is, is really not there at the moment. And so my fear is that it will not necessarily be the technology that's the problem. <laughs> It'll be the more classic problem that our sort of organizations uh, are, are the problem. 
care. And let me bring the human factor back in there again, because there will be temporarily the advantage on both sides because of this arms race. Each, case, each side will have the edge, but it will only probably be of short duration before some other technological advance rests it back again. But again, one thing that remains constant is the humans that are the targets. And let me take the case study of Katie Jones once again. If we look at how she was detected, it was because one of the targets of her influence thought, this doesn't smell right and decided to do some digging and looked at, for example, the fact that uh, this photograph that was used was unique across the, was, didn't show up in any reverse image sites, uh, which is extremely unusual. Then passed it off to, to co-author Munira Mustafa, who actually did the digging, examined it closely with her expertise on Photoshop, looked at things that did not look right. And that's what eventually led to the conclusion that this was an artificially generated image rather than a photograph of a real human being. But it required, a little bit of critical examination, a little bit of stopping, thinking, assessing whether the information that you are being presented with is actually legitimate and actually plausible. Not many people will actually go through that process when presented with a deep fake. But as long as you can flag them as, uh, as being non-legitimate content in a sufficiently rapid and way and so disseminate that information sufficiently widely, then all of the technological solutions that Tim has been detailing will be extremely important for heading off disinformation campaigns before they take hold. Yeah, and one wrinkle to that, which I would add, which I think is, is interesting and I spend a lot of time thinking about, right, is that I think there's, there's the layer of the individual and then there's also the layer of the, the platform that delivers the content to them, uh, even before they receive the information. And, and I think the companies have been you know, ambivalent, uh, I guess, you know, about what their policies are on this exactly. Uh, and I think the decisions they make there will be um, pretty important to the question of how many deep fakes, for example, a given user is exposed to, right? So even you get, even before you get to the human nature point, there's a question of sort of platform policy that will actually influence the space in quite a big way. Yes, yeah, you're right. And, and, and as Care mentioned, many of the existing deep fakes are actually relying on existing disinformation infrastructure within those platforms like the bots and you know, one of our products is, is, is to track these uh, bots and unfortunately I have to say uh, they're still there like uh, three or four years after starting to look at them nothing has happened with a significant or big the biggest proportion of the ones that we found and that's also one of these problems that the space is not sanitized enough from those interactions that allows to piggyback on the on this on this problem with a deep fake um, add-ons to make it more uh, difficult. Now let me bring a couple of questions um, from 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 the audience. There's one that uh, that, that asks uh, whether, besides KP, Katie Jones, are there any deep fake cases where the uh, officials have been targeted? Um, so my question, do you know any of those? And the other question I wanted to, to bring up, uh, probably more to Tim, but also probably to Care, there's this idea that is now brought in a uh, question form. Is there any way to create a system for certification codes to be embedded in a video to reflect it was produced by the organization that says that produced it? So kind of uh, watermarking the, the video or, or, or picture. What would you think of that? Well, let me defer to Tim on the technical question because that, that question is very close to his um, radioactive seeding idea and the, the, the watermarking, the uh, tracing the data through uh, to see how it's been treated is, is one of the proposed solutions. Of course, an immensely complex one which needs a lot of different organizations and a lot of different software providers on, on board to work. But on the uh, who else has been targeted, I suspect I am certain that they must have been. I am also certain that we will probably not find out about the majority of these cases. One of the problems we have is that it is deeply, deeply embarrassing when you've been subjected to one of these. It is close to catfishing and romance fraud in terms of the amount of, of personal shame that it engenders in somebody who's been taken in. Uh, the Katie Jones case study identified people who were engaging with her for all sorts of different reasons, including the classic case, if we're talking about human nature, of that, uh, that one US army officer to, who, to his credit, was incredibly frank and just said, uh, I clicked on the picture because she was hot. But plenty of other very senior individuals uh, were not willing to detail exactly what the extent of their interaction had been, which means not only do you not know when it's happening, 
but also you don't know when it succeeded because nobody's actually going to admit to clicking on the malware link that they have been sent or to following whatever instructions they received from a deep fake personality. So we have seen that there has been this multiplication of uses of a Katie Jones style fake face. What we don't know and probably won't know without the cooperation of the platforms, which as you've intimated is, is the key to unlocking all of this, but is never forthcoming. We won't know to what extent they have been successful and indeed how prevalent they are across the systems as a whole. Tim? Great, yeah, and I'm happy to pick up the other question on sort of watermarking. Um, so there are a number of initiatives that are underway uh, to, to try to do this. Um, and part of the complexity, if you think about it a little bit, is, is at what point the watermark is actually applied is a very interesting question. You know, does it happen at the point where you snap the photo uh, or is that the point where you upload it to a social media platform? Um, and I would say, you know, in all these cases, uh, I think it's important to be humble about what we can achieve. Uh, in some ways, I, I would kind of echo what, what Kara has already argued, uh, which is that the history of these kinds of kind of unbreakable authenticity codes in computer security, right, not, not even talking about disinformation campaigns, um, is, is not really a good one, right? It just turns out that the adversaries are quite effective at uh, breaking authentication regimes, imitating authentication regimes. Uh, and so my worry would be that we'd actually build too much credibility around a signal uh, that could then subsequently be abused. Uh, and so um, I think that there is some benefit that can be achieved with these technologies, but it's important not to overstate the case. Yes, and, and, and that brings me a, 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 a different uh, question that kind of uh, tries to address the deep fakes from a different perspective, not a hostile adversary, but in a context of a uh, internal political debate where actor can create based or potentially can create uh, um, political narrative based two political narratives simultaneously, especially if combined with a, um, with a micro-targeting, uh, with, with, with two very different alternatives based at least one on, on the deep fake. How do you think we can deal with that? Is there a solution for this? Um. Well, it's, it's complex. I mean, I, it's one of the things you're pointing towards is the problem that a lot of platforms have had in creating definitive policies here, right? Because uh, having previously worked at Google, you know, the, the, the strategy of the company is to always stay out of domestic political disputes as much as possible. Um, and, and I think it's, it's in some ways forced them to take a very neutral position, which in effect has permitted uh, the distribution of this kind of content um, and, and not really challenge things like bots, right? Um, and so... Um, you know, I think ultimately it has to fall on civil society groups to do this. Uh, and, and I think part of the problem you see there is that a lot of the groups, um, you know, the journalists, the, the fact checkers, the other types of NGOs that would be usually responsible for this type of activity don't necessarily have the technical capacity on board to do, you know, effective large scale deep fake detection. Right. And so I think there is a need to kind of create more technical expertise or at least create sort of international groups of experts. Um, that can work with groups on the ground to deal with these types of problems, um, because I think that's where the most sort of effective activity will occur. I hesitate to follow on from Tim because he's actually got ethics in his job title, so this is <laughs> this is his uh, this is day job. But um, for me, the key point is: is there an intent to deceive? Is it actually a malicious campaign, or is it something which is overt? Are you presenting presenting an alternative reality that is actually overt and declared to the audience? There are ethical problems that come up when you are inadvertently producing something which is too real. Consider the example of Google's virtual assistant, which in early trials was found to be too convincing. So you have to actually explain to people uh, before their interactions with it that this is not a real human. If we continue down that path where it is made clear to the consumers of this information what exactly they are looking at, that's a very different situation from intentional deception, where in my view, domestic political actors who are exploiting this technology against their own populations are no less malign than those who are from other nation states who are seeking to influence the domestic political processes from outside. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, having or doing deep fake is not necessarily malign. It's the intent behind the, uh, the actual product that, that makes it malign or or fun or good. And that's, I think, an uh, important distinction. So it's not the technology, it's the people with the intent behind the technology. And I think um, also on these political systems, it's pretty clear that there are ways to agree on the new rules. And that's uh, what I, I think we've been seeing 
there's a need to a new debate of what is ethical and moral in a political debate in a democratic country. I think these these rules have agreed rules have been somewhat blurred because of the technological advance and the possibilities. But that's of course you're from Europe which uh, thinks that regulation is not such a bad thing and, and people can do some of it. Um, I have an interesting question, um, kind of a slightly but not overly provocative. Which country do you assess has the most sophisticated deep fake capabilities and technologies? Who does? <laughs> uh, so I haven't done a, a close analysis of this, but I, I can give you some indicators that would be helpful, right? Um, just because I think that, you know, the, the slogan that I always use is that propagandists are pragmatists, right? And so, you know, it, it, not every actor is going to use deep fakes just because of the, the cost of deploying it, especially when you consider all of the alternatives, right? And so, you know, I, I do think that deep fakes will be most used by state actors that have access to sort of the technical expertise to really pull off custom deep fake production uh, in, a, in a cost effective way. Uh, and so, you know, I think that that rules out a lot of the, the actors that you might imagine and, and I think corresponds to the landscape that we think right now. Right. Which is that we think that um, China and Russia are, are experts in this. And I do think that they will also be pushing the, the sort of R&D of these types of campaigns as well. Thanks, Tim, for diving in first. I'm very grateful you did that because I simply don't think we can answer that question. <laughs> I think the, the technologies that we are talking about are in the domain of uh, things which are so advanced in, in seeking AI and cyber solutions that they will be deeply, deeply classified. They're not things that, uh, that you and I will be able to form an assessment of from open sources. That's very different from mainstream deepfake uh, technology, which has commercial applications, which is now being democratized and commodified. If we're talking about the real bleeding edge of developing these future leading technologies I was talking about, uh, I would assume that just as with, for example, zero day exploits, nation states or other serious actors will do their best to keep them under wraps until they're deployed for a sufficiently worthwhile specific target. So I'm sorry, Yanis, and I'm sorry to your, uh, your viewer, but I really don't think we can opine on that. We may not find out until it's too late. So by that answer, you kind of imply that actually countries would see that as a uh, competitive advantage if they have the, uh, the the capability to produce something that could be of a significant impact, which is also a good thought to 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 have and take away and 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 consider. Um, let me now uh, turn to a a kind of comparison between different types of deep fakes. We've seen a lot of uh, pictures, we've seen videos, uh, some better, some worse. But very little of audio. You care uh, referred to one case that is uh, publicly known of the fraud on a uh, on audio. But isn't first why audio is lagging? Second, because of not having these examples, isn't that now the most dangerous of types of deep fakes we might face because people what would not be factoring in this consideration. I, I, I've, I've sometimes uh, thought myself, if I get a phone call from the number of a known person and I hear the person's voice, I would never ask for the ID. I would just fall for it. Um, so what are your, or your views? Absolutely. I think this comes back to, uh, to the point I was making earlier on that uh, because all of the excitement, all of the publicity has been about video, uh, all of the other forms of deep fake, whether it's uh, still or audio or text, have been relatively overlooked. And I'm not even sure it's necessarily the case that they are lagging. Text, uh, machine generated text, maybe machine generated audio already has those confirmed cases. And in fact, it's several cases where CEO fraud has been carried out by means of, uh, of imitating the voice of known individuals and doing so successfully. And of course, if you are a company that has been defrauded in this way, you have a serious problem because your insurance is not going to pay out because the attacker 
didn't actually bypass your security procedures. They just went through them and, and succeeded in, in passing through them and, and pulling off the scam, pulling off the fraud. So in that instance, unlike with deep fake audio, we've got, the, we've got the confirmed cases where it is effective and works. So it may not be necessarily correct to say that it is lagging behind, but certainly it has received less attention than, all of, than, than video in particular. And that in itself makes it more dangerous because there is that lack of awareness that you're talking about. Exactly that sensation that you might, uh, that you just described, where you see a call coming in, you think you know who it is, the voice sounds plausible, uh, when are you going to stop and think, is this really my grandmother? Tim? Uh, no, I think that captures a lot of what I was going to say in response to that question. I think probably the only thing I'd mention uh, outside of that is, uh, that in some ways the, the machine learning, le the state of the machine learning field is most advanced for images uh, at the moment, uh, and in the images and in, in connection video as well. Um, audio is kind of lagging behind for a number of technical reasons, uh, and so th there is in addition to kind of the the sort of practical aspects of implementing the technology, the, the research is also somewhat less sophisticated at the moment at being able to simulate in, in really high fidelity uh, what we see in the images side. Okay, so now let's imagine a, a, a head of state, prime minister and president turns to you and asks, well, what should I do to make sure that my country is safe from malign deep fakes. What should I do? What should I invest in? Should I opt for the state of the art uh, technology training programs? What would be your, your suggestion and your guidance? For me, it is, as I emphasized this at the end of my prepared part, not treating deepfakes as something which is separate from malign influence and deception overall. So folding it in instead to awareness campaigns, to media literacy, to making sure that populations are aware when and how they may be under information attack and treating this as just another example of the ways in which this might happen. Should they be spending on technology? Uh, absolutely, but the question is who does it? I would like to think that just as there's been this democratization and commodity of the tools for attacking. So the detection tools too are going to become widespread very rapidly and very easily accessible, in fact, accessible to publics as well as to nation states. But for me, the fundamental principle uh, always has been in terms of defending yourself against information attacks, simply being aware of the threat, which enables you to deploy that critical thinking about whether the data point that you are being provided or who it appears to come from or the medium through which it arrives is actually legitimate and trustworthy and if not, what the objectives of the malign actor might actually be. Tim? Yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, I, I would emphasize that deep fakes are just one part of the picture. I mean, I think in many cases what we see is there's this obsessive focus on deep fakes, right? And, and my worry is that we might spend a lot of time and resources, you know, figuring out how to detect this in, you know, 10 different ways, uh, but then miss the bigger picture, right? Which is, which is campaigns of disinformation. Um, I would say as a matter of public policy, I am very interested in the idea that if a public knows that a campaign is underway, uh, putting the public on alert can be a really powerful way at thwarting and detecting disinformation efforts. And so uh, I am very attracted to the notion of, um, you know, in the same way that we have air raid sirens, right, that we should have some kind of air raid siren for sort of informational campaigns in cyberspace, right, that there should be a way for uh, a state to notify the public that it has evidence that one of these things is in progress, right? And um, I think that's an interesting way of kind of thinking about, you know, how do we make these, um, how, do, how do we put the public on alert in a way that's like simple, easy to understand and can be kind of rapidly activated? Well, I, I'm afraid in some of the countries, if we had this parallel of air, air raid sirens, they would be um, uh, uh, having a sound all the time. All the time, right. <laughs> So uh, probably something a bit more uh, sophisticated would be necessary for, for some of the countries. Now, um, uh, you also touched on the, the, on the, the kind of companies, uh, Facebooks and others, as, as part of the ecosystem of deep fakes and, and the way their policies uh, would enable or prevent spread of these things. What would be your uh, recommendation for how the companies are they doing enough or should they do better? And if they, they should do better, what are the areas where they should um, enhance their operation? 
Yeah, at least on the specific matter of deep fakes, at this point, most of the companies, because of public pressure largely, have taken a sort of stand on the issue. Um, but I think it's very difficult to get an assessment of how effective they are at enforcing those policies and indeed what they are doing internally to improve their detection of things like deep fakes. And so we just don't really know. Uh, I, at this point, you know, I would say a lot of the large intermediaries of the web uh, ostensibly should be doing something about this, right? Um, but it's very difficult for us on the outside to be able to tell. And I, I really think that they should be taking a stronger sort of stand in, in being transparent about what's going on there. And again, that's just a subset of the overall problem where yep. cooperation from the platforms would be absolutely key in, in preventing malign influence campaigns because they have access to all of the data about how these are being mounted. It is only because they treat that as a black box, which through financial or ethical or any other concern does not allow those who are countering this information to see it and see the processes happening inside and forces them to make best guesses from the outside as to what's going on. That is the main break on counter these malign influence campaigns. If there were a different situation where platforms were actually actively engaged in ensuring that their companies were not used for malign influence against the societies within which they thrive and prosper, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It would be a totally different disinformation and malign influence landscape. Well, and, and I think it, it brings me to, the, to my next question that is kind of coming to the end of our discussion. What is your future view? Let's say seven years. Um, what would be the disinformation landscape and the deep fakes role in that landscape? Best case and worst case scenarios. Like for two minutes each, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> No pressure. I, I, care. I, I jumped on the other one, so you have to go first for this one. <laughs> um, normalization, ubiquity, acceptedness. The fact that you are dealing in your online virtual experience with, uh, with personae that you may not know or no, may not even necessarily care are based on real individuals or on on machine generated tools. And that's not just in terms of disinformation, but in fact, in your every interaction online with, uh, with other agencies, with other people at the end of the line. And so again, it just falls into the landscape. It is just part of the overall environment within which you're consuming information in exactly the same way as it is now, just adopting new tools and rapidly normalizing them in exactly the same way as we've seen through the development of the internet. Yeah, I would say, I mean, one of the most intriguing things uh, about sort of disinformation campaigns on the historical scale, right, is that it, it sort of is a never ending arms race, right? You get better at producing fakes and you get better at producing detection and the people producing fakes improve. And one of the interesting things we see in the technical literature right now is investigation into what's known as counter forensics, which is if I know you're trying to detect my deep fake, I can actually implement things in my deep fake to defeat your detection system. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I do think that this, this arms race continues, right? That we will see deep fakes, but the game will now move to this meta level, right? Which is, we know you're trying to detect us so I can do certain things to try to defeat that detection. Um, and, and I think that will, that will create another turn in the sort of wheel uh, uh, of the kind of ongoing competition around these technologies. Um, I'm sometimes actually wondering, like in seven years, when you assume you can produce uh, all sorts of imitation of human in a form of uh, picture, video, uh, language, voice, and that's becoming so available and like quite easily accessible and, and part of everyday life what would be the human psyche reaction to it? What would be the, 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 the human factor responding to it? I, I was uh, recently talking to one uh, scientist that looks at how the smart houses and the Alexas impact the child's uh, behaviors, where they, they conceptualize Alexa as a human being and are looking for them into the basement or where they live and etc. I'm just wondering how much that would affect some part of the, the, the way we perceive things, especially um, with the younger generation. And I think therefore also the way uh, we will be able as a society to respond. And from my perspective, I think that's the place or the piece that we've not really considered. 
I think we can consider immediate effects of those things, but uh, the secondary effects, which go back to the way the human brain uh, reacts or adapts to these realities, I think is something that is of a um, unknown, and I'm afraid that unknown might be something that might uh, catch us uh, unawares. Now, since uh, uh, we are three and a half minutes from the end, I will uh, give you both a chance to wrap up or address any of the issues you think we, 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 we should still uh, highlight uh, for, for, the, uh, for the viewers. Um, so we'll start with a reverse order care. Certainly. Let me just pick up that point you just uh, you just mentioned the the interaction with machines and how it might be uh, how it might be in a few years from now. I think that's an excellent example of how in so many of these things we're talking about this as future problems, but we're actually already there. Uh, as you know, let's take the classic William Gibson phrase: "The future is here; it's just not evenly distributed." And when you you're talking about the possible future um, emotional interaction with a machine, you talk like somebody who's never been frustrated or annoyed with Siri when she can't understand what you're saying or, or mocks, your, mocks your question, because it does generate a perfectly human response when you're interacting with a machine and always has done ever since you first swore at your car when it wouldn't start. So it's nothing new. We're already there. Deep fake videos are already a problem of the, of the recent past, and we don't need to look seven years into the future. These things are progressing so rapidly that it will be far sooner than that when this becomes entirely normalized. Yeah, I, I take it from a slightly different direction, right, which is thinking about the impact of increasing automation on what people choose to, how people choose to construct their communities online. Uh, I mean, I think there's one view, which is that people will just get used to it, right? That kids will basically say, well, I've always lived in a world where on social media, 90% of people are fake. And so I have no problem with that. Um, I think the other view is one where people, you know, that you, that you believe that things like trust are still really needed in social communities uh, and that what will eventually happen is that these kind of public areas of the web, your sort of Facebooks and Twitters of the world, will eventually become so toxic in some sense uh, that people will increasingly flee to smaller and smaller communities online, right? That they will disappear into um, chat applications, right, or, or other private groups. Um, and I do think that that is a trend that we, we do see uh, and, and I think we'll see increasingly over time as, uh, as it looks like these kind of public spaces get more and more crowded uh, with automation. In, in some ways, they'll sort of crowd the humans out. Thank you. Thank you. So today we looked at the subject of deep fakes and I have to say I think the outlook is not as bleak as we might have expected two or three years ago. We're in a much better place than, than we thought we will be. And I think uh, in a paradox, uh, I think at least from this discussion I conclude, it's partly also to this phenomenon of so much talk and hype about this. Uh, there's been much more awareness in the society, much more public discussion about it. There's been technological advances in, in trying to find the ways how to detect these uh, technologies, how to shine the light on them. Uh, and thus, uh, co in combination of, with the fact that it doesn't require sometimes really a very sophisticated uh, technology to f fool a human, that has not uh, allowed the deep fake to really make such a big um, impact that we were afraid of. But I think uh, what I also take from this discussion is that we should not let our guard down. Because that is one of the tools that is being used and will be used in disinformation and influence campaigns. I will be up to uh, the human creative nature to find how it can uh, work on, on the human mind. And it will be also up to a human uh, creative nature to find the responses to that and we have to keep tuned if we don't then we'll get surprised and of course we always have to remember at this point that in the discussion that uh, both Tim and Kerr said that we haven't seen the big actors capabilities fully yet for whatever reason but we should not doubt that there are these capabilities so we should keep our guards up so that in case somebody feels like trying to use it, we have enough tools to, uh, to respond to that. So 
at least one part, I would say, of this disinformation uh, battle, we've not been too bad. We've been able to avoid the worst case scenarios. We're not probably in the best case scenarios, but not, not really that far from it. Um, so we've been good at this. And um, we've had two very good speakers, Care and Tim, to, to shine the light. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I hope uh, you enjoyed this discussion as well. And uh, the next webinar will take place on 13th uh, May, same time. And next time we will look at the Russian footprint in the Western Balkans information environment, new area, not new area for Russia, but new area for the center to explore more. And we'll have the speakers, Professor Dimitar Bechev and Mr. Milan Yonov. Yo Jovanovic, sorry, <laughs> it, it, it's been a long day. So thank you very much for everybody for tu uh, tuning in. Um, uh, I hope that was useful, at least for me it was interesting, but I'm biased, I take it. Uh, and hope you to see next time back in our Stratcom webinars. Keep safe. Thank you.